I want to start very quickly with uh, a prayer as we get into this, our second uh, installment of Powers, Principalities, and Bodiless Hosts. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. The holy angels watch over us at all times during this perilous life. The holy archangels be our guides on the way to heaven. The heavenly choir of the principalities govern us in soul and body. Mighty powers preserve us against the wiles of the demons. Celestial virtues give us strength and courage in the battle of life. Powerful dominations obtain for us dominion over the rebellion of our flesh. The sacred thrones grant us peace with God and man. Brilliant cherubim illumine our minds with heavenly knowledge, earning seraphim and kindle in our hearts the fire of charity. Amen. 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 So hello once again to, uh, to everybody, to this our second installment of uh, Powers, Principalities, and Bodiless Hosts. Um, the title of this second installment is Morning Stars and Flames of Fire. And I hope to get to those morning stars and flames of fire, but we do have a little catching up to do from last time. Uh, we spoke last time, again, about uh, demons and uh, devils, uh, specifically more about devils than about demons. And we'll, we'll um, recap the, um, the distinction that we're making in just a second, or at least hint at it. Um, so I'm going to recap a little bit from last week. Uh, we focused on the, uh, and forgive me for, okay. <laughs> we focused a bit last week on the divine council idea. Uh, the divine council idea drawn largely from Genesis 6 and Psalm 82 and alternative texts of Deuteronomy, as well as uh, referencing Genesis 1. This idea that the Beni Elohim, which are spoken of throughout the Hebrew Testament, and which um, is uh, uh, basically synonymous with the members of the Divine Council, Beni Elohim means sons of God. The idea that the Beni Elohim, the sons of God, are the denizens of heaven referred to at least again in Genesis 1, when God creates heavens and the earth, and then he populates the earth with animals and plants and human beings, and then he populates the heavens with stars. Now, um, when we read stars in the Hebrew Testament, we are not talking about sort of um, the things that we study in science that are these sort of gaseous bodies that, you know, create light and the sun and all of these things. What we're talking about are living beings, the writers and the people in the, the ancient world would not have seen the heavens and thought, oh, these are dead, cold things. These are merely sources of some light that are taking millions and millions of years to reach us and all of these things. No, they would have thought of these things as living creatures. And indeed, the way that Genesis 1 speaks of the stars God refers to them at least as having some kind of agency because he gives them rules over times and seasons. There's a sense that what they're meant to do is meant to oversee uh, rhythms and patterns of life on the earth. They're given some kind of governance. And God doesn't generally give governance to things that can't actually exercise it. And we see this language that is brought forward again in other texts. We see in Job. We see at the end of Job, when God is scolding Job in many ways, um, God says, were you there when I created things and the morning stars sang for joy? And the morning stars sang for joy. This is, the, again, an idea of stars as living beings. When we get into Daniel, Daniel um, 12 speaks of stars. The, the, the righteous shall shine like stars in the firmament. We're talking about some kind of a heavenly being. And even in Paul, when Paul speaks, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians, when Paul speaks of there is one body of uh, uh, stars and there's celestial bodies and there are terrestrial bodies, what he's speaking of are not necessarily, you know, what are stars made of in the physical sense. He's speaking of what is the body of an angel? What is the substance of the being of an angelic being or a celestial being or a, a celestial occupant of heaven? So this is what we're talking about here when we're talking about the divine council, this idea that, um, that comes through much more specifically in Psalm 82, that around God are 
these various other spiritual entities with whom God has uh, deigned in God's graciousness to share in the governance and in the overseeing of creation. And of course, as we've seen in Psalm 82, God is not very happy with many of them because they do not do justice. They do not uh, look out for the poor. They do not look out for the widow and they're actually tyrants. When we speak of these tyrannical angelic beings, these tyrannical members of the divine council, what we are speaking of are the devils, these rebellious uh, spiritual entities, which appear, first of all, again in Genesis, when we speak of the serpent in the garden. Serpent, you'll remember, is a, a word that in Hebrew uh, is the word seraph. And the word seraph, again, serpent, but it also refers to, or is the word from which we get the word seraphim. Seraphim is one of the orders of the angels that we'll talk about hopefully very soon. Um, seraph itself means burning or shining one. And it means both serpent and this angelic being, probably because a serpent has poison and can be, uh, which burns us, and the light of the, the heavenly being can be quite radiant and also can, can, can cause us to uh, close our eyes. <laughs> they are shining, they are burning. There's also a sense, depending on who you read in terms of your, your scholarship um, uh, about these things, um, there's also a sense that it, it, the seraphim are, um, could be serpent beings, that the, the six-winged beings that we talk about when we're talking about seraphim are serpent-like with six wings. And so the serpent in the Garden of Eden could have been, according to this theory at any rate, could have been one of these fallen um, or rebellious spirits from the divine council, from the order of the seraphim, who is trying to... Um, undo or at least disagrees with what is going on in on earth disagrees that god has something of favor something that looks like favor or mercy or grace for human beings and would rather god not have anything to do with them and so offers in a very tempting way the idea to adam and eve to us to human beings the idea that we can be gods and divine beings ourselves on our own steam this is the initial rebellion, the idea that the, um, the, that the seraph has, that the serpent has, that they can be God on their own steam. And that serpent shares it with us. We can be God on our own steam. We can be divine. We don't need God for this. If only we would do X, Y, or Z, we will become the gods that we desire to be. And that turned out to be very enticing to us. And the separation in the garden, think of the Garden of Eden as um, a kind of prototypical uh, temple in the midst of which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, a place where heaven and earth are actually meeting. There's a sense that Eden is on a little bit of a hill. There's a sense, just like the temple in later days will be on a hill. There's a sense that what God is doing in Eden is creating a place in which heaven and earth meet. The upside of that, it has to do with union between heaven and earth. The downside of that has to be, or, or is, when one of these fallen spirits or rebellious spirits comes among us and decides to sow discord and then creates a separation where there ought not to be a separation. Now, as we're talking about these things, you'll notice certain themes coming through. And the themes coming through have to do as well with um, Genesis 6. We see the Beni Elohim, the sons of God, uh, who are lusting after the children or the daughters of men, and they create Nephilim, the giants, the, the men of renown, the, the legends and the heroes of, of old. These, this is the description of how it is that these rebellious spirits have decided to make heaven on earth by creating a union of heaven and earth that is actually not licit. And so we have the human beings the, the being afflicted by this union of heaven and earth, which ought not to be. Nephilim itself, um, it's a, a fuzzy word. We don't necessarily have a, a very direct or um, not necessarily complete, that's not the word. Um, there are many things that it could mean, but it seems that the, the thing that it means best, given context, is fallen ones, which could either mean those that have fallen 
as in fallen from grace or revealed fallenness, or those that fall fiercely upon their foes, which goes back to the idea that they are heroes of renown, that they are violence, um, violence personified in many ways. Mm. Um, when we get into the New Testament, and we talked about this as well last week, when we get into the New Testament, when Jesus expels unclean spirits from people, there is an idea that these are the spirits that are being talked about, um, that these violent creatures and beings that are um, illicit mixtures of heaven, heaven and earth, um, this illicit mixture is unclean in the classic sense of things that are unkosher are unclean. So this is why they're called unclean spirits. Um, Interesting ideas, but nonetheless, what we're talking about when we're talking about these rebellions of these angelic beings, of these, this divine council, we're talking about um, desiring to join heaven and earth in ways that are not good, either for heaven or for earth, but certainly not for us, right? Okay, <laughs> we're going to continue a little bit on... Um, so we're most familiar with this idea of the, the fallen or rebellious spirits. Uh, we're not so familiar with this idea of the Nephilim coming back or doing things. There's a little bit of a, of a hint in this in some of the other literature, certain like Enoch, first Enoch, second Enoch, etc. Um, we are, however, very familiar with a particular exemplar of these fallen uh, slash rebellious spirits, which is uh, Lucifer. And we'll get a little bit into Lucifer in a second. Um, we talked also about the, the difference when we're talking about all of these things, the difference between sort of logos and mythos. We talked about two different ways of knowing, right? Um, and I brought that up last time, and I want to clarify a little bit that so often when we look at angels, we often think that, oh, these, this is just a fictional thing. This is just nice storytelling. This is just lore that we have in our back pocket in order to understand things that we can't understand. Um, but I want to suggest actually the opposite. I want to suggest that, um, that we often think that, or at least that way of thinking, points in the direction of thinking that there is only one way of knowing the world, and only one way of thinking about human experience, this sort of the, the logical, the rational, the scientific, whereas there are many other ways of knowing the world. There are many other ways of understanding what we mean as human beings and how we are in the world. Um, and I wanted to uh, clarify that a little bit because I don't want to, again, I don't want anyone to come away from these uh, sessions thinking that, you know, angels and, and, uh, and devils are mere metaphors for things. They are, they are realities that we have encountered. And if tradition is nothing else, it is certainly the memory of a community, a collective memory and experience of a community that is passed down from generation to generation. And tradition certainly is one other way of knowing the world and our relationship to it and of understanding meaning and a meaning making in this world that is not opposed to the scientific or the rational, but is complementary to it, right? So what we're, we're dealing with here are, uh, as our friend Shakespeare has, uh, has told us, there are more things in heaven and earth than are contained in our philosophy. How are we to know those things? Well, by having various ways of knowing at our disposal and not just one and not just two. Okay, so that's a, a, a <laughs> recap of where we were last week. I hope that is, uh, that's helpful, particularly for those who are coming in uh, that are new. And now I'm going to power through talking about the devil. How about that? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay. So uh, as we begin to talk about the devil, and then we'll talk about angels in, in a moment, um, let's go back to the beginning once again. So while most ancient Near Eastern stories of the birth of creation speak of a chaos demon being conquered by a representative of order, who then forms creation out of the chaos being's body, um, here we think about the, the Babylonian Marduk slaying the chaos dragon Tiamat and stretching out her corpse to make earth and sky, this sort of agonistic creation story is conspicuously absent from Genesis. Interestingly, though, chaos is not absent. There are echoes of these ancient Near Eastern stories in Genesis and the tohu bohu, the formless void that God serenely and effortlessly conquers by speaking light and all of creation into being. However, it is from this ancient Near Eastern context that the devil as dragon comes about. 
The imagery as Satan, as dragon in Revelation 12, is a recontextualizing of the chaos dragons of ancient Near Eastern mythology. The imagery of the serpent underscoring it and drawing us back to Genesis 3 and the serpent seraph lurking in the garden. Again, though, there is no discrete devil per se in Hebrew scripture, except via a New Testament hermeneutic. The Hebrew scriptures don't call this fallen creature. Hey, 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 where are you? You've got... What happened to Mark? <laughs> we can't hear him. No, something no. went wrong with technology. Yes. Huh. Just like that, it got cut off. Yeah. Well, well I'm sure it's the technology because the volume went first, I think. It's the devil. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. He was just getting ready to talk about it. This is like Harry Potter, where you can't say you know whose name, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> trouble. Okay, how about this? Ah, is this is, yes. Are we, are we here? Yes, we, we hear you and see you. Thank Woo! You. Okay, I don't know what happened. The devil but, did uh, it. <laughs> we, we, could just, we could certainly blame it on the devil. I don't know if you, you folks know this. There is in the, the um, in medieval tradition, uh, when medieval monks were copying out manuscripts, uh, there was a tradition that, that uh, errors were introduced in manuscripts because of a special demon named uh, Titibilius. And Titibilius is the one that would um, make the, the scribe's hand a little lazy or whisper, like maybe you should go off to sleep. Um, but that's why scribal errors come into text. I think in this day of technology, Titibilius has um, a much broader uh, job portfolio. Um, and one of them is, uh, it has to do with frustrating um, <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> okay. So, we see the Satan at work first in the story of Balaam and his donkey in Numbers 22. The angel that stops the donkey opposes Balaam for Balaam's own good. That angel is called the Satan the adversary, the one that opposes. We see the Satan again in Job 1, you'll remember, where he acts as a kind of prosecuting attorney in the heavenly court and a tester of resolve through opposition. There also, by the time we get into Job, there also is a sense to him that he is perhaps not the most impartial prosecuting attorney. He really does uh, have it in for humanity and wants to prove to God that humans are not really worth it. Other demonic figures are noteworthy in the Hebrew Testament, but they're also rather ambivalent and uh, sort of strange. Azazel, the demon that dwells in the wilderness and to whom the scapegoat must be sent on the Day of Atonement, is just one such example. Uh, this might explain in part the association of goats with sin and evil and the eventual assimilation of goat features to the devil. But that also has a lot to do with the horned devil being a visual representation of a bestialized humanity a particular understanding of the Greco-Roman pan, the half-goat, half-human nature deity. Regardless, by the time we get to uh, the New Testament, the devil has indeed become the devil, probably through cultural contact with Zoroastrianism and other religious traditions that, as opposed to Judaism at the time, did not have such a robust understanding of demonology. In fact, a lot of demons and demonic names, and we talked about this a little bit last time, that come down to us through demonological lore are the names of the gods of other nations. Beelzebub is a perfect example. It's probably a corruption of the title Baal Zebaal, the Lord of Lords, an aspect of the god Baal in Canaanite religion. 
Beelzebub, which we get in scripture, is a name that means Lord of the Flies. And Lord of the Flies is either meant to be an insult to Canaanite religion generally, or, uh, well, not really either. It is meant to be an insult to Canaanite religion generally, and is a different understanding of Baal's lordship over the flying ones, which could mean in its Canaanite context, other angelic beings or heavenly spirits, um, but according to the Jewish context, flies. It's in Zoroastrianism, however, that we get a robust sense of a being purely opposed to the chief or principal deity, that is uh, Ahriman or Angramanyu, the evil spirit, and that is a deity opposed to Akura Mazda or Spentamanyu, the good spirit, and the deity that will win the day when good and evil finally battle at the end of time. It's Zoroastrianism's influence on Manichaeism that, uh, from which we likely get a robust sense of a cosmic dualism between opposing spiritual forces of good and evil. But that dualism, however, is ultimately problematic for Christianity, because Christianity is not actually a dualistic religion. The fathers and mothers of the church affirmed time and again that evil has a negative ontology, which is to say it is not a thing in its own right. It has no positive thingness or being. On the contrary, evil is a diminishment or lack of the good that is or ought to be present. We know there is evil in the world because the good in the world is obscured. Evil is parasitical. And because being in itself has been acknowledged by the church as good, as a fundamental good, nothing that is can be purely evil. Because insofar as it is, insofar as a thing has being, if only to that extent, there is goodness in it. From a Christian perspective, pure evil is impossible because it would simply be an empty, nothing, beinglessness, an absolute void from which nothing comes. Evil, therefore, has no intelligence of its own, no being of its own, does nothing, thinks nothing, is nothing. And yet, again, we know evil because of a good that is lacking. This is why the imagery of light and darkness that John so often uses in his gospel is so useful when speaking of good and evil and also occasionally misleading. But to illuminate a darkened room, you do not shovel out darkness, you turn on a light. And this is precisely what God does as the first act of creation. The devil, therefore, cannot be pure evil, a disciple of evil, one that is working against the good. Yes, we too can be disciples of evil. We too can serve the empty void and throw ourselves bit by bit into the vacuous nothingness. We too can become the intelligence of the void as some rebellious fallen spirits have become intelligences of the void. And paradoxically, though the void is beingless, it is nonetheless real because we know evil is no illusion, because we know sin is no illusion. And here, when we speak of an intelligence of the void, here perhaps we might pause to consider what that might really mean, the identity of the devil it suggests to us. And we might pause to shudder, maybe, or weep while we're at it, because we're speaking here of a being's ability to desire their own nothingness, their own annihilation, as if it were their true self, and over against the being that they have been given. We're speaking of a being choosing the void, which is to say of a being's flying from all that is, including itself, including its own sense of being. So imagine the fall of Satan, not as a juridical pronouncement or punishment from an angry deity, but as the result of a creature's choice for its own creatureliness, to be apart from all it receives as creature, to be apart from its creator. Imagine a creature that desires itself apart from God and God's all-pervasive love and seeks, therefore, a place in itself where God and the good that comes from God is not. It seeks impossibly to place at the center of its being an absence of God, an absence even of itself. For such a being, what darkness would it not seek? 
And where might it seek it if not in undoing its own being by trying to tear apart the ground of its own being to make room for the absence it desires? We're speaking of a creature so turned in on itself and so necessarily consumed with hatred for the fact of its own being or for being generally that it will spend eternities on end trying to tear from itself the spark of being that enables it to tear at anything to begin with. Or as Charles Williams succinctly put it in his first novel, War in Heaven, all destruction is his own destroying of himself. Such is the intelligence of the void. It's a way, of course, of talking about what it really means to sin, what it really means to die, what it means to bend one's being to oblivion and away from God, away from what we were meant to be in relationship with, away from who we were meant to be. It is perhaps just this sort of intelligence, though, that might deploy this sense of evil as void, evil as anti-being, as ontological other, to suggest the figure of the devil be diabolically co-opted and used to demonize and dehumanize others throughout history. It's this sense of a, a, a being that is so anti-being <laughs> that um, through temptation, through example, through modeling, allows us, gives us permission when we go along with it to demonize each other and to see others as um, other with a kind of capital O. There's a lot more that we could go into here, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to, to spend too much time. I had a whole section from, uh, from Marlowe's Faust, uh, Dr. Faustus, that I wanted to read, um, which is uh, quite fascinating. It's, uh, I think, well, I'll, I'll read a little section of it. It reveals something, I think, about the nature of the devil, the nature of devils, the nature of these rebellious spirits, um, who and what they are and what they try to inflict on us and on the world, um, why it is that they are, well, it's a, a kind of revelation of who and what they are. So I don't know if you know the story of uh, Dr. Faustus by, uh, by Marlowe as, as well as by uh, Goethe, but it, it comes from a traditional story. I'm sorry? Okay. It comes from a, a traditional story of a, a scholar who wants more knowledge and he decides to give up all of the university learning. He gives up theology, gives it all up. And he decides to, um, as Marlowe puts it into his mouth at the beginning of Dr. Faustus, he says, magic has ravished me. So he uh, decides that he is going to summon the devil and make a deal with the devil. And Faustus, when the devil appears as Mephistopheles, a, a, a rather mischievous, cunning devil, uh, Faustus asks the devil, what is that Lucifer thy lord? Mephistopheles says, archregent and commander of all spirits. Faustus, was not that Lucifer an angel once? Mephistopheles, yes, Faustus, and most dearly loved of God. Faustus, how comes it then that he is prince of devils? Oh, by aspiring pride and insolence, for which God threw him from the face of heaven. And what are you that live with Lucifer? Unhappy spirits that live with Lucifer conspired against our God with Lucifer and are forever damned with Lucifer. Why? Where are you damned? asks Faustus. In hell. How comes it then that thou art out of hell? And this is the tragic beautiful tragic line that Mephistopheles has. Why, this is hell, nor am I out of it. Thinkst thou that I that saw the face of God and tasted the eternal joys of heaven am not tormented with 10,000 hells in being deprived of everlasting bliss? O Faustus, leave these frivolous demands which strike a terror to my fainting heart. This image However clever Mephistopheles is, this image of a being that is so consumed with rebellion, so consumed with uh, nothingness, with evil, that he himself has become hell. This is a, a tragic notion, um, but I think a very uh, illustrative notion of what the devils and the demons are. And now we get to angels, yay, for just a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit. Indeed, morning stars and flames of fire. Again, the word angelos is the Greek word um, for messenger. 
and it nicely translates the Hebrew word malach, which is also messenger. But not all heavenly creatures, as we have seen, are angels. A link between ontology and mission appears to obtain when it comes to the spiritual creatures. So an angel is a spiritual being to whom God has given a mission, a task or ministry that subsequently appears from then on out to define its being at a fundamental level. An angel is one who does the will of God. One of these spiritual heavenly beings that does the will of God when they appear, they are ambassadors or interpreters of the divine will, heralds or executors of the divine will. They are also innumerable. And we've given, uh, we're given some sense of what they are by scripture. They're called, as we have seen, sons of the morning, morning stars. This is likely just to indicate to us that they are denizens of the heavenly realm, which from the ancient perspective appear to us as stars in the heavens. It cannot be stressed enough, once again, that when our ancestors looked out at the heavens, they saw a living universe, a living beings, living entities lighting up the skies. The scripture also calls them flames of fire in Psalm 104, as well as winds. All of this is likely just to suggest that their divine and spiritual nature. We might have in our heads, though, when we speak of angels or think of angels, the idea of little winged babies or little winged baby faces like floating around and, and things. This is uh, not a particularly useful image. Um, it's uh, more like a Renaissance artistic fever dream uh, mashup of Christianity and classical pagan um, <laughs> notions. Angels either appear as mortals, uh, we see them appearing as mortals in throughout Genesis, having the, the, the form of people, or they appear as quite surreal and scary. And I'll just read to you uh, a little bit from Ezekiel 1, um, a description of angels as Ezekiel saw them. Out of the midst of a great fire, in the center of which was something the color of amber, which shone very brightly, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. They had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they, had, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies, and they went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. This is not a, a lovely little infant with, with wings. This is something much more. And you can see Ezekiel struggling with language to try to encapsulate, to try to give a sense of what these spiritual realities that he's experiencing are. Now, the imagery that he gives seems to be associated with the Lamassu of uh, Babylon, um, these cherubim, the Lamassu, you see them, you can go into any museum and you could see um, sort of things that have wings and also a human head, but maybe their body is an oxen, maybe their body is, a, is a, a lion. But interestingly, Ezekiel takes it a step forward. He, not just a, a man's face and the body of a lion or an oxen or the feet of a lion and an oxen and the eagle, no, all four, and all four simultaneously. This is a lot, this is a lot. We read also in Daniel 10, where there's an image of uh, Daniel encountering an angel, which is just overwhelming in its colors, overwhelming in its, uh, in its being. Um, and whenever we encounter an angel in the book of Revelation, uh, interestingly, uh, John falls on his face whenever he's introduced to a new one, falls on his face to worship. It is so awesome, this presence that he encounters. And the angel is always also very keen to point out, no, do not do that. I am a fellow servant with you of Almighty God. Get up, I have something to show you. That is the pattern in, uh, in the Revelation. 
We're given names by which to classify the angels, augmented by the likes of Dennis the Areopagite, to give us a ninefold hierarchy of angels. We have the seraphim, and the ninefold hierarchy moves from proximity to distance. So the seraphim seem to be the ones that are closest to God, most like God, um, the burning ones, the shining ones, the, the ones that may be serpents with six wings. These are described by um, Isaiah in Isaiah 6 when he has the theophany in the, in the temple. The seraphim seem to like to hang out close to the temple, close to the presence of God. So when you encounter one of these things, you are near to the presence of God. And this is the pattern in scripture. At least. The cherubim, which is what Ezekiel was describing, the tetramorph, the four-figured, four-shaped things, um, they are also quite close, but not as close as the, the seraphim. And then the thrones slash ophanim. The ophanim, this is the, the Hebrew word for them. It means a uh, chariot or wheel. And we have the descriptions of them in uh, Ezekiel as well, of wheels within wheels that are studded with eyes. Again, not a, a very... Um, uh, not a very close <laughs> picture, not a, not a, not a picture that, that might allow us to identify very much with the angels. Then there are the dominions, the virtues, the powers, principalities, archangels, and angels. It's possible that these principalities are the spirits that are referred to uh, most specifically in the divine council uh, notion of things um, that have rulership or rule or, or dominion in some way over the nations of the earth. The principalities are the, the, the angels of nations. But let's also note that archangel and angel are both orders of spirits, orders of angels, um, as well as angel being the word that encompasses all of them. And we have the names of certain archangels, which may not actually belong to the order of archangels. <laughs> so we have the names of Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel. Michael and Gabriel, you, uh, you will know from, from scripture proper. Um, Raphael, you will know from the book of Tobit in the, um, the apocryphal, the, the, the intertestamental literature. And Uriel, you will know from, um, from the book of Enoch. And their names are all having to do with who and what they are as people, as, as, as creatures that have been given a mission by God. So Gabriel means the strength of God. It's very curious to me and um, illuminating that Gabriel is given uh, the strength of God, is the one that is given the, the task to go to the Blessed Virgin and give her the news of Christ's birth. Um, because here we have the strength of God becoming... Um, submitting itself in some ways, being in relationship with a human being in a way that does not classically look like strength. It looks like invitation. It looks like something more than what we think of as strength. Because so often, again, our notions of strength are dictated by notions of violence that go way back to these fallen Nephilim and the things that we learned from those uh, fallen angels. Keep in mind, again, in Genesis well, it's, it's explained more in, in Enoch. Those fallen angels that went among the daughters of men, they also uh, decided to teach people various arts and crafts, most of them having to do with warfare, how to make weapons, and how to wage war. So Gabriel means the strength of God. Raphael means the healing of God. Uriel means the brightness of God. And Michael means who is like God, which could mean that he is a very high seraph, it could mean that he, uh, he very much appears when he appears. He dazzles like God. More often than not, it's seen that his name is his battle cry. Who is like God? Nobody's like God. Who is like God? That's his battle cry. Tradition, though, names three others because we like sevens. Seven is a number of wholeness. So those, uh, depending on your tradition, could be Yegudiel, Barachiel, and Sialtiel, which are Yegudiel is um, God is one, Barachiel is the, the blessing of God, Sialtiel is, uh, has to do with prayer, uh, the prayer to God. Um, though they are not the only examples <laughs> of who might fill out the, the other three in the in order of seven, we also have various angels coming to us from uh, mystical as well as uh, magical literature um, and intersections of the two. Think of the, the angel Ratio, the secret of God, who in Kabbalistic lore um, is said to have revealed the, um, the Sefer Yetzirah and the uh, secrets of Kabbalah to Adam and Eve and uh, later on to 
the various patriarchs and things, secret of God. There are also other uh, interesting extra-biblical angels, such as uh, Metatron. Metatron is an angel that comes to us from uh, the Sefer Hechelot, um, or Third Enoch, as well as the Maaseh Merkaba. Um, Metatron is, uh, is kind of a, an interesting image of what it means for a human to become an angel. In Third Enoch, we get a whole monologue that Enoch gives us describing the process of what it means to become an angel. But Metatron is also an angel that in the, uh, some rabbinic literature and some uh, Jewish mystical literature is an angel that is encountered as, um, as a very great presence. And, uh, and very often the person that is encountering Metatron wants to bow down and worship them. And then suddenly a fiery flail comes from heaven and, uh, and beats Metatron in order to prove that there is a power higher than Metatron. Um, Metatron is sometimes known as the lesser Yahweh. Um, and this is very problematic, as you can imagine, in a lot of the uh, Jewish mysticism and uh, Hebrew mysticism that we have, because there ought not to be a lesser Yahweh at all. Um, there is only Yahweh. So what is this being? What is this being Metatron? We, we don't have time to, to get into it, but it's fascinating lore. Um, and it might relate, though, to this figure that we see throughout scripture of the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord in, um, in the Hebrew scriptures often speaks so much with the voice of God that you will be introduced to, for instance, the, the, the burning bush in the desert, and the angel of the Lord was there in the burning bush, and suddenly the angel of the Lord goes away, and we hear the words of God, and we see Moses dealing with the angel of the Lord as if he were dealing directly with God. So there is a sense of... Um, there's something going on here in scripture that seems, at least from the Christian perspective, to point to um, a way by which we can understand that while God is one, God is not necessarily a oneness that is um, numerical, if that makes any sense. We're, being, uh, we're laying the groundwork from a Christian perspective for notions of the Trinity and the life of God as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost which is one and also three. Okay. There are a lot more things that we could say about angels, about, um, about Metatron, about the various things. Um, we could talk about guardian angels. We could talk about angels that assist us in following the commandments of God. Um, we can talk about um, the nature of angels as revealed in scripture, which is not always the most kind. Let's look at Zechariah and his... Uh, encounter with Gabriel and Gabriel striking him dumb because he asks a question. Um, but the, the general picture that we're given of angels in scripture is that somehow they instantiate the patterns of heaven. Somehow they are not simply because they were present there, they are the primordial spiritual powers of creation, the living realities that undergird slash support matter, all living terrestrial creatures, as well as social and political realities and relations. There's something about angels that they are the spiritual powers that undergird various things. Think of that uh, beautiful story um, in, uh, I think it's from the Talmud, that speaks of there being, uh, at the base of every blade of grass, there is an angel that whispers grow. Think of that as an image of angels and the angel's relationship with all of created being and matter. Angels are also archetypes of human worship. They are the ones that carry out the, the celestial worship in heaven. But here is uh, where we, we, we get to some interesting ground that we only have time to mention today um, because we are uh, running out of time. The angels, Paul says that we will judge the angels. Whatever we are is not meant to be subordinate to angels. Whatever we are is meant to be in communion with God. And the angels are just our, um, you, we could say, uh, distant siblings in the orders of creation, cousins in the order of creation. But what we are is not meant to be subject to them. What we are is not meant to be in fear of them. What we are, according to the New Testament, we are meant to be in union with God. Jesus Christ did not come as an angel in order to save us. Jesus Christ shared our humanity. 
And there's a real sense that when the Bible speaks of us becoming children of God by adoption, there is a real sense that we are going to be invited into this divine council. That as the angels have been called the Beni Elohim, the sons of God, we are being invited to become children of God in the same way, and yet in a deeper way, because again, Jesus did not become an angel to save. Jesus became one of us. So our trajectory <laughs> in the order of creation and the order of things and in God's will is that we become one with God and take our place in the heavens um, in a way that has, according to God's love and God's mercy, has upended what we generally think of as the order of heaven and earth, upended it all in order to restore it and renew it in a way that looks like real union, real love. I hope that makes some sense. Um, again, in Daniel 12, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. What we are being invited into when we are being invited to become children of God through Jesus Christ and by grace is not to become angels. We're invited to become part of the very family of God that even the angels cannot know in a way that even the angels cannot know. This is actually a profound and wonderful thing. Think of all the, the, the ways by which we imagine the power and the, the majesty of angels and think of all the ways by which we sort of think of ourselves in our fleshy, earthy sense here. Well, what we are is the thing that God decided to share most intimately. God became one of us, again, not an angel. There is something deeply beautiful and wonderful about this, that what we are is more mysterious, more beautiful, more radically wonderful than any angel could ever dare or hope to be. And I'm going to leave us there with this um, mystery of who and what we are as human beings, particularly human beings in Christ. Thank you all. I'm going to, to I'm sorry I don't have time for any questions, but you, you know my email address, so, so please don't be shy about uh, asking questions. Um, thank you all. God bless you all. Here, here. <laughs> Yay. And, uh, thank you. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. That was too late.